It is a place where the exotic is normal. It's really disturbing, actually. But deep inside this market begins a trail of tears. Endangered animals bought and sold for big bucks. Oh, get it, get it, Mike, get it. What can be done to stop this illegal trade? He'd actually built a secret compartment within his prosthetic leg, and that is where he concealed the baby iguanas. In the prosthetic leg. This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, but we're doing it in a unique way. <laughs> this is a show about science. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> by scientists. Techno investigates the animal smugglers. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Marita Davison and Dr. Crystal Dilworth. Now, to start off today, we're going to be talking about the illegal trade of animals. Now, this is wildlife smuggling of both live animals, dead animals. It is huge around the world, and especially here in the U.S. Some of the numbers involved here are just staggering, and there's estimates it's $10 billion a year, I mean, in this illegal trade. Yeah, it's a huge illegal industry. We've reported on the illegal trade in ivory, but unfortunately, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're talking about hundreds of species here. In order to put this problem into focus, Techno investigated just how pervasive this really is and what's being done to stop it. Let's take a look. This is Bangkok, Thailand. Here at the world's largest flea market, weekend shoppers can find almost anything, including cage after cage full of exotic pets. For the right price, you can buy rare and even endangered species. A South American macaw, a monitor lizard, and African tortoises, to just name a few. Techno shot this video at the busy Chattachuk Market. With the camera off, a shop owner offered to sell us what looked like a protected leaf monkey. This is why the World Wildlife Fund now recognizes this market as a hot spot for the illegal animal trade. That's really disturbing, actually. There's no telling what you're gonna find, right? Joseph Johns is Chief Prosecutor of Environmental Crimes at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles. I showed him some of the video we shot at the market. Some of these animals come from South America, come from Africa, go through Thailand, and then end up in the U.S. Because that market is allowed to thrive. You couldn't do this in L.A. You couldn't do this in San Francisco, Miami. You couldn't do this anywhere in the United States of America. The Thai government is cracking down, but the country is still considered a funnel for the $10 billion illegal wildlife trade. Since the United States is one of the world's biggest consumers of it, there's a good chance that some of what is sold there will find its way here. Because animals can easily be bought online and shipped, I visited the International Mail Center in Los Angeles, California. Here, inspectors see a flood of endangered species coming through their doors. Between a million and a million and a half pieces of mail pass through this facility every month. Each one of them has to be inspected by Customs and Border Patrol officers, and some of these pieces are more interesting to those officers than others. This day, one of the hardest working inspectors is on duty. Oh, get it, get it, Mom, get it. Within the first hour of our arrival, Lockett, a canine inspector for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, finds something. Lockett is part of a pilot program and is this district's first canine inspector. She's trained to identify up to 20 cents, and she's already proven her value. It would take me an entire day to look at 100 packages. She can do 100 packages in five seconds. With her, I clear 10,000 packages easily a day. That's some good work there, Lockett. Yeah, she's got a pretty powerful nose. On this morning, Lockett found a python skin wallet. Across the world, there are 25 different breeds of pythons hunted for their skins, and several are endangered. So no python products can be imported into the U.S. without special permits. The wallet is confiscated and added to an unbelievable stash of exotic animals and their parts seized at Los Angeles points of entry every single day. What is this room? 
This room right here is what we call our property room. When we seize items that are in violation of wildlife laws, they are kept as evidence until the case is adjudicated, and then we have some way of disposing of them. This room that seems more of a morgue serves as a valuable learning tool. Almost all types of wildlife are represented here, and behind every item is a tragic story. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Supervisor Mike Osborne knows most of them. A great deal of media attention is rightly focused on rhino poaching for horns and ivory from elephants. I see pangolin, sea turtles, monkey skull, ivory, and then this thing. What the heck is this? Uh, this is one of the hottest things on the, on the market today. This is an air bladder from a fish called the tutuaba. The totoaba is actually a sea bass. It is so critically endangered, and it can only be found in one place in the entire world, the middle of the Sea of Cortez. It is now being illegally harvested for its bladders. Since they're touted as an aphrodisiac in Asian cultures, each bladder can sell for up to $15,000 on the black market. That promise of big profits from illegal wildlife sales motivates sellers to get creative. I've had monkeys jump out of suitcases. I've had birds fly out of toothpaste boxes. They get more and more intricate nowadays. People do ask me, what's the strangest animal you've ever seen? And I'll tell them it's man. Man will do some pretty strange things with endangered species to make a lot of money. The case of Jeremy James is a prime example. Jeremy James is one of the more unusual smugglers that we've encountered here in Los Angeles. James was caught red-handed trying to sell endangered banded iguanas from Fiji. There are less than 10,000 of these animals left in the wild, and James had several of them. He actually stole from a wildlife preserve in Fiji during his honeymoon. He'd actually built a secret compartment within his prosthetic leg, and that is where he concealed the baby iguanas. In the prosthetic leg? Yes. The arrest affidavit claims James tried to sell the iguanas to an undercover fish and wildlife agent, and also admitted to selling three others for $32,000. But the case didn't result in jail time. This is one of James's victims, a female iguana now living at the San Diego Zoo. While being smuggled in James's prosthetic leg, her own leg was so badly injured it had to be amputated. It's pretty sad, actually. 30%, at least, of all the animals that I bring in on a yearly basis are confiscated animals. We get a lot from Fish and Wildlife Service. Kim Lovich is curator of the reptile house at the San Diego Zoo. The zoo does have repopulation programs, but it's virtually impossible to return seized animals to their original homes. You want to provide this animal with its opportunity to get back into the wild as quickly as possible. But if you don't know exactly where that animal's from, you could be introducing viruses to a naive population. So many of the zoo's seized animals will live out their lives as species ambassadors, hopefully helping to educate the public so more don't end up in captivity far from their country of origin, or even worse. A lot of it is the moral aspect. Isn't it a shame that we couldn't live with this animal? That we had to hunt it to the point of endangered? We had to hunt it to extinction. One of the common things I tell people is, the more of this stuff we buy, the more of these animals are gonna die. Until they do become endangered, they do become extinct. This is an endangered species. It doesn't belong in your living room. It belongs in the ocean. And I've got a bag here that's made from a West African dwarf crocodile, another endangered species, clearly done in a somewhat garish design, if you will. I mean, it's got little feet and, and teeth. And teeth. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to say, there's a couple reasons you shouldn't buy that. For one, it's these are pretty tacky, let's be honest. But also, these are endangered. But how is anyone to know that what they're buying is an endangered species? And that's, that's one of the challenges that they face, that you do see things like this in a lot of markets that you go to around the world. Sometimes you just think, you know, maybe they farmed it. In some places they do farm, but they're still farming an endangered species. You shouldn't be buying it, you shouldn't be bringing it into the US. And I think that there's a fair amount of public awareness that things like rhino horn, things like elephant ivory, that's illegal, you shouldn't be purchasing things like that, but we don't have as much of a knowledge or understanding of 
things like turtles, things like this, or even other species that, you know, we just don't really even think about in the context of an illegal trade. The illegal wildlife trade is an example of man's interaction with nature at its worst. But coming up, we'll be seeing the bright side of man's interaction with nature in the magic of mead and why business is buzzing. Now, it may be the oldest alcoholic beverage known to man, but when I say the word mead or honey wine, what image comes to mind? Okay, so I think of a Renaissance festival or maybe Game of Thrones. That's right, like Chaucer, Aristotle. I mean, mead's kind of the ultimate classic. And I've heard some people even refer to it as hipster honey. Now, what I love about it is, yes, it's delicious, but it's also got some really interesting signs behind it. Let's take a look. This isn't ancient Greece. It's predominantly alfalfa, but there's a little bit of clover. Or medieval England. This is different than what I expected. Yeah. yeah. Um, a little more splash in there? Yeah. This is how they do it in Point Reyes, California. Known for its vanilla characteristics. Oh, this is good. And even though this is the heart of California wine country, and this may be bubbly, this isn't champagne. This is mead. You can imagine the Vikings. <laughs> it's mead. It's so epic. So you gotta thank the bees, I guess. The bees. Thank the bees. This is what mead is made from. Nice and steady. There you go. Bees, and of course, honey. Archaeologists and scientists say mead is mankind's oldest beverage. Traces have been found in ancient Chinese and Egyptian tombs, and now, after centuries out of style, mead is making a comeback. Jordan Thompson is the horticulturist at Hadron Meadery. Her job is to figure out which flowers bees like best, because a happy bee is a productive bee. Should we get off and go check it out? Yeah, let's do it. And this is where it all begins, in a garden fit for a king. Lots of flowers. Lots of flowers. Oh my gosh, there they are. There they are. Doing what they do. So what kind of flower is this? This is Eryngium, or sea holly. These, they see in the UV spectrum, so blue is most attractive to them. And ah, I didn't know that. That's probably why they're very attracted to this plant. Once the bees collect their pollen, they're going to head straight to their hive, and so are we. Brad. All right, Phil. Brad Albert has one of the most important jobs here. He is the meadery's beekeeper. Wow. Are you serious? So this is about the closest you'll ever want to be to this many bees. But if you look inside, there's some honey. Looks pretty good. Why do they even make honey in the first place? It's their food. So honey is bee food. Honey is bee food and pollen is bee food. So honey is their carbohydrate and pollen is their, um, is their protein source. So when you remove honey from this, does that affect the hive at all? They oftentimes make a surplus and that's what we take. How do we get the honey into a jar? It's as easy as just scraping like this. There we go. And then we just load that into the extractor. You want to do the honors? Let's do it. So this extractor basically spins these things so that the honey just flings off and hits the wall. Exactly. So the bees here do the farming. That's right. They're doing the work for us. Gordon Hull is the man behind the meadery. So this is our honey inventory right here. So this is all honey. We've got uh, um, macadamia nut honey from Hawaii. It says Montana. Right, Montana. and. Um, and then we have the smaller buckets here, which represent our honey. So all this honey is from around the country, and then this is the local flavor. Right, exactly. We have to take care of a slight problem we have. Wow. This honey is solid. What? It's super saturated sugar. And so in order to take care of this, we have to heat this honey up, and we do that in there. So this is basically a giant chemistry lab where you get to make wine. That's right. This is a honey heater. Oh my gosh. Is this thing warm? Yep. Wow. Are you serious? This is that same honey. So you heat it up to 105 degrees Fahrenheit so that it will liquefy. 
Oh my gosh, that is a lot of honey at the bottom of this honey heater. Making mead can be a pretty messy business. Check out these outtakes and you get the idea. The way Gordon and his team make mead is closer to the way traditional champagne is made. That's where the science comes in. After the honey is diluted and purified, it goes into the fermenter. He adds the same yeast they used to make grape-based champagne. Probably the best thing I will ever drink out of a beaker. So why is it that there's just honey in here but I'm tasting these other things? Because honey contains the essence of the flowers from which it was composed. Really? So the bees are drinking the nectar of the flower and they actually take some of the essence with it? Absolutely right. And that's what makes honey such an amazing substance. Turn, turn, turn. The final step is pretty cool. It's called riddling, where every turn of the bottle slowly sends the remainder of the yeast sediment to the top of the bottle. How is that? Perfect. Nice. Good? Yes. And the way I figure it, mead just might be the next big thing with a very interesting backstory. All possible because of science, of course. Why don't you do the honors? Start to come out. Ooh. Very good. Well, took four months from honeybee to mead, so cheers to the honeybees. Cheers to the honeybee. This story seems like an entomologist's dream. I mean, talk about biodiversity, talk about bees, and there's a tasty drink at the end. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. And what I loved about it is their crop. When you go outside, it is those flowers, and it wasn't just the bees there. The butterflies were there, the birds were there. It was the only crop I've seen that actually like increases the biodiversity in an area. It's, it's almost unheard of. Yeah, I mean, I think when we normally think about an agricultural setting, Sadly, now it's very homogenous, you know, these monocrops. But in this case, you know, it's a very diverse system that's promoting a lot of biodiversity, a lot of ecological richness, which I think is fantastic. You know, if there's anything I learned from this, it's that science can happen anywhere. It can happen in wine country, it can happen in your own backyard, or it can happen very far away. Crystal, where are you taking us next? Well, of course, I'm taking you to Mars. I spoke to the NASA scientist behind the movie The Martian, and we'll separate fact from science fiction. It's coming in and out of the spectrum. Jubilant engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab witnessing the Pathfinder rover landing on Mars. Almost 20 years later, their invention is a key plot point in a big budget Hollywood film, The Martian, where an astronaut becomes stranded on the red planet. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, none of this matters anyway. Hollywood has long been fascinated with depicting humankind on Mars, dating back to a 1910 film by Thomas Edison. Abbott and Costello added a comedic twist in their film, Abbott and Costello Go to Mars. I hereby claim Mars in the name of the United States of America. But it's this 2015 Hollywood depiction with an assist from NASA that is getting people once again excited about space travel. I think it was really the best movie ever made about what life would be like to explore another planet. The Martian is Hollywood filming at its finest. But what are NASA's real plans for a manned mission to Mars? The team at JPL broke down the myths and realities of how close science truly is to putting a human on Mars. Robert Manning was the chief engineer of the real Mars Pathfinder, which allows Matt Damon's character to communicate back to Earth. He consulted with Hollywood designers on a prototype for the film. I think it's very accurate. If NASA does get a person on Mars in the 2030s, it will be in part because of JPLers like Manning and Jennifer Trosper. She's the mission manager for the Mars 2020 rover and well aware of the accomplishments needed to make it on Mars. Our next mission is going to do 20 samples on Mars instead of four or five that Curiosity's done. And so we have to figure out how to make the rover faster and smarter and more operable on the surface to collect these samples. NASA has proven it has the right stuff for sending robots to Mars. But there's a big leap needed before they send humans. Lift off. The voyage could take up to 270 days. 
the International Space Station is currently observing how space travelers deal with this sort of psychological deprivation. We're learning more about how isolated crews perform and interact, and how the brain responds to the stresses of prolonged spaceflight. Once astronauts make it to Mars, they've got to be able to land. Manning and Trosper are researching new parachutes high above Earth to engineer soft landings on the red planet. So right now we can do, what, the size of a Mini Cooper? Yeah, a small car. <laughs> we can do a small car, and we need to land 10 times that. We're investing in the technology, and uh, we can get there. The most pressing issue after landing is being able to breathe on Mars. It's cold at Mars. There's hardly any atmosphere. It's only 1%. It's not breathable. It's carbon dioxide. We actually are developing an instrument called MOXIE, which is going to take the carbon dioxide, pull apart the carbon from the oxygen, and, and actually pump the oxygen into a little chamber as a demonstration to convince ourselves that we know how to create breathable oxygen on Mars. And this is really the first mission, Mars 2020, where we're really trying to bring in those new technologies and bridge the gap so that we can send people. There's still the issue of hydration. NASA just recently confirmed the existence of water on Mars. Growing food is also another challenge, like Matt Damon's character space farming potatoes in The Martian. I am the greatest botanist on this planet. Would it be possible to grow something as complicated and energy intensive as a potato? There may or may not have been the right ecological conditions for, for potatoes to grow. One of the things we're still trying to figure out, though, is what are all the chemicals and minerals that are in the soil itself? Part of that process is taking place now on the International Space Station, where astronauts are successfully growing lettuce. I think we can get there. That's the exciting part, is there's a path. Getting to Mars has its challenges. NASA has published a plan to get a human on Mars in the 2030s. For Manning, the biggest hurdle to make the deadline is funding. I think 2030 is a little early. We've got a lot to do uh, to go from a, a Curiosity-style landing to a set of missions where have, have modules and multiple astronauts is a tall order. Depends on how much money people are willing to spend on it. Both Trosper and Manning do believe humans will be on Mars in their lifetime. Wouldn't it be awesome to expand beyond the Earth to understand bigger things? The hope is that a movie like The Martian could capture the public's imagination and maybe engender a different kind of support for the next space race to Mars. You know, my only concern was that I don't want the public to think that NASA actually has that kind of money to work with right now, because they don't. You know, I think this is a call for if we want this to be our reality, and it's a pretty awesome reality to send people to Mars, we're going to have to put money where our mouth is. Right, and it could be. I mean, a lot of the science in the movie, as you saw, are real programs. These are being developed right now. The, the ability to grow crops, to create a system like that, is so complex in a place where we understand the conditions on our own planet. Being able to do that on a place like Mars is just really mind-boggling. Yeah, I mean, they, they did simplify some of those things in of there. Of course. But it, it gets your imagination going. This episode really shows what can happen when you combine imagination and science. And it can result in a pretty delicious drink in a field in Sonoma, or even potentially growing potatoes on Mars. It was all great stuff. That's it for this episode. We'll see you next time, right here on Techno. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus, and more.